I think sometimes we tend to take our Lord's Day for granted. It's a beautiful day we've been able to be together with the saints and worship God. <coughs> I think perhaps the best way to think in terms of what the Lord's Day really means to us is try to imagine what the world would be like without the Lord's Day. To be able to go to the world and not have the fellowship of the saints and not have the encouragement of the Lord's Day worship would be certainly a trial indeed. I thought a lot of times if it would be possible for us to pick a time when the Lord would come again, how nice would it be to be in the service of the saints, worshiping God here. When the Lord come, and let's just go on worshiping God over there. What a wonderful time that would be. But I know that these things, when we come together in our worship services, are something that are designed by God to build us up and make us stronger. And I know that we're together tonight for the good, and we certainly hope and pray that, that you'll be benefited by your presence tonight. Tonight I want to talk with you on the subject of James chapter 2 and verse 13, which speaks of the mercies of God. That particular passage has been used by some, strangely enough, because of they do so many times in so many passages, to try to put in some kind of conflict obedience to God and the mercy of God. This passage in James 2 and verse 13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And then the statement of mercy triumphs over judgment. The first part of that verse is showing clearly that with regard to our treatment of one another, judgment is without mercy for the one who has shown no mercy. If I am not merciful to those around about me, then I cannot expect God to be merciful toward me. In that case, it's very equal and likely to forgiveness in that one of the prerequisites for me being forgiven is that I forgive those who sin against me. I think the first part of that is easily understandable in that God expects us to be merciful to one another and if I have not expressed mercy to those around about me then I can expect no mercy from God. But then the statement of the latter part of that verse says that mercy triumphs over judgment. And strange enough, there are individuals who want to take that phrase and somehow array it against other scriptures so that the end result is that mercy is treated in such a way that it nullifies judgment. In fact, some who try to use that verse suggest that perhaps because mercy is some way going to triumph over judgment, that that simply says that God is going to have universal salvation. It doesn't make any difference how you live. It makes no difference what kind of life that you've uh, lived or what kind of evil deeds you've committed. That when you finally get to the judgment bar of God, that God is going to wave his hand like some type of doting old grandfather and just open your arms and open his arms and welcome you right into heaven, even though you might have lived a reprobate life. I think I find that sentiment expressed most often when I attend funerals. I've been at funerals of individuals who make no pretense of being a Christian. They have not lived for God at any time of their life. They've never been a part of the Lord's church. They've never sacrificed for truth. They've never rendered obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet some preacher will wave his hand over them and talk about how they have in some way, somewhere, expressed some kind of faith in God. Therefore, they know they've, sent, they've been gone on to heaven. Sometimes you'll find individuals who have turned their back upon the Lord and they'll be a part of the human lodge of some kind because they wear a white apron and have a sprig of green so that the preacher or the person who conducts the service to say, well, he's going to go to heaven. No, he wasn't a member of the church. No, he uh, had no pretense of living the Christian life, but after all, you know, he's gone to that grand lodge of love. And this kind of language is the language that you find people expressing when they use the sentiment of James 2, verse 13, the latter part, to suggest that the judgment of God is going to be nullified by mercy. Now, I believe the scriptures I believe that the verse that is, that is expressed in James 2, verse 13 is the truth of God properly understood. But I do not believe that we have the right to ever take a verse of Scripture and array it against another Scripture. I don't believe it's right to take a verse and so twist it and so turn it. So that the end result and the end of, the end of thinking of that verse is to say that the other verses that demand the obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ are therefore nullified. And I know that there are many people out this noting attitude about God, that he is like the old grandfather, and being a grandfather, and having granddaughters. I fully know that they're able to twist me around their little finger. And I know what it is sometimes to see a granddaughter do something she ought not do. 
And I'll spank my granddaughters as quickly as I spank my daughters, and they know it. And yet, even though that's the case, I find myself letting them get away with things that I know they ought not to get away with. And that's a doggy grandfather for them. But I'm afraid sometimes that individuals think that's the way God is. That he looks down the falls with some kind of benign grace, and that he sees us do all these wicked things, and he sees us thumb our nose at his law, and he sees us live in a way that is viol uh, in violation of all that he stands for, and yet finally when he comes to the judgment of God, he's going to say, well, I just love you. Come on in anyway. And I wonder if we truly think that the rest of the Bible uh, can be so twisted to give that view to this particular verse. First of all, I want to look at what the definition of mercy is. Vine tells us that mercy is an outward manifestation of pity. It assumes the need on the part of him who receives it, and resources adequate to meet the need on the part of him who shows it. All that's implied is that there's someone who needs mercy or pity, and that here's one who's able to grant what he needs. And it's an outward manifestation of pity. Now, there are some people who say, well, I don't really pity. Well, I suggest that the human family needs the pity of God. We need the mercy of God. The psalmist one time talked about talked about himself and said, I'm a worm and not a man. And I recognize that he's not saying that man, as God created him, is a worm. But he's saying that, well, that man, as man who goes into sin, is like a worm in the thing that he does, that he's beneath what God intended for him to be. He's not a man anymore, he's a pitiful creature. So man in sin is certainly pitiful. Now, Thayer goes on to say that mercy it is mercy or kindness or goodwill toward the miserable or the afflicted, joined with a desire to relieve them. And this suggests that God sees our true condition. He sees the way we really are. And God has mercy and pity toward us. And it's a wonderful thing. I want to tell you tonight that I don't believe that we have a right to come to God and ask for justice. I don't believe that any of us in our lifetime has a right to come to God and say, just treat me the way I deserve to be treated. Because all of us, Romans 3, 23, asserts, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm not going to stand before God and ask for justice. Because God could righteously condemn every one of us from that to everlasting torment because of our sins. And I recognize that I stand before the throne of God tonight as a need, a one who's in need of mercy, one who's in need of grace. I know furthermore that because I stand in need of grace, that I stand before one who's able to supply all those things. And this is what Fair and Vine both said. But I believe it's a mistake of tragic proportions to think that the mercy of God is going to be distributed generically or without limitations. Please listen to me when I say to you that I believe the grace of God has limits. Please listen to me when I say to you that I believe that you could go beyond the grace and the mercy of God. I recognize that we serve a gracious God. And I recognize that we serve a God that is full of mercy and abundant of loving kindness. But I believe you can go to the point beyond which God will not go. And I recognize that there are sins that cannot be forgiven. And I'm not talking about a sin that's a particular kind uh, that is sort of taboo. But I'm talking about an attitude of one who is impenitent, one who is hard-hearted. I believe that one who really comes to God in penitence, one regardless of sins, who repents of sins and comes back to God with an open and penitent heart and does what God wants them to do, I believe that person can be saved. But I believe that I can tempt God's grace, and I believe I can go beyond the point where I'm not able to be reached by the will of God and by the mercy of God and by the kindness of God. Yes, I believe that the individuals that I have known to have gone beyond the grace and mercy of God, of God because they've been so hard-hearted and so rebellious in their attitude toward God. And so there, we must recognize that the mercy of God is not limitless, and the grace of God is not unlimited. And when we begin to understand that, we need to recognize then that some conditions to grace that I believe apply with regard to grace and mercy. First of all, I want to think that that is a misuse of grace, of mercy, and the idea that God is going to wave his hand and just ignore sin as though sin did not exist. First of all, I think it ignores the character of God. I mentioned this morning in 1 John chapter 1 that God is light, 
and in him is no darkness at all. If you understand that verse, you cannot assume that in James 2 and verse 13 means that God is going to overlook and weep at sin because that just will not happen. God's very nature will not ignore sin. Sin must be dealt with. The sin problem in the human family is going to be dealt with by God and has been dealt with. We've looked at the definition of the sin that involves our condition. The definition of sin has to do with the fact that we are pitiful in sin. I believe that Ecclesiastes that speaks of the fact that God made man of right. He loved many inventions. The idea expressed there that when God made man, he made him in his image. And I believe that man, as he reaches his potential of good, and as he reaches his potential of service to God, that man can be beautiful what he is. At the same time, man in sin is a beautiful creature. You don't have to go very far and off the text to see that that's the case. And by you, if you doubt that, to come down the south side of Fort Worth, I'll show you some pitiful narratives of humanity. People who, when they were born, they were born as innocent little babies. Yet they grew up and rebelled into God's will. They have ruined themselves both morally and physically and spiritually through sin, and they're pitiful creatures. And the love of God expresses itself not because we are so lovable. The love of God expresses itself not because he just feels like we're so handsome and so beautiful and that God just cannot live without us because he desires our presence so much. That isn't the reason why God is expressing mercy to us. His mercy is because God loves us with the kind of love the Bible talks about. So we need to understand very clearly then that the definition of mercy is because we are pitiful indeed. And the Bible asserts that God is merciful. In Ephesians chapter 2, Beginning at verse 4, Paul said that God, who is rich in mercy, you know, back in the Old Testament, one of the prophets talked about the fact that we have to try God, put God to the test. He said, just do the things that God asks you to do. See if God will not just rain down blessings upon you so much so that you can't even contain all the blessings. Friends, God is never stingy. And you can't outdo God in goodness. And the more you do for God that is good, God is going to abundantly bless you above all that you're able to do in the thing. So Paul describes to God in Ephesians 2 that God is rich. He's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, making us alive together with Christ, by grace have you been saved, by mercy have you been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul again says, Blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, and God of all comfort. The Father of mercy suggests that he is the originator of all mercy. That is, mercy has its source from God. You cannot know of kindness and mercy. Did you not understand it from Almighty God? On one occasion, the disciples came to Jesus, and one of them said, Lord, if you'll just show us God, it suffice of us. And he said, I've been with you so all the time, and you don't know that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the point is that if you really want to understand God, come to understand Jesus Christ. Jesus is the out, out coming out from God. He is the expression of all that God is. Hebrews chapter 1 talks about him being the illusions of God's glory and the express image of his person. Thus, when Jesus Christ came and walked upon the earth, and he was moved to compassion by the multitude, when he healed the sick and did all the things good for humanity, and then gave himself to the cross, he was expressing mercy as it is expressed in the very character of God. And so not only is he rich in mercy, but also he's the father of all mercy. In Psalm 6 and verse 4, the psalmist said, Return, O Lord, deliver me. O save me for your mercy's sake. Here David recognized that he was in the need of salvation and that God could save him for his mercy's sake. Then, further in Psalm 51 and verse 1, it's been suggested, I think, by most commentators, that the 51st Psalm was written by David after his sin of Bathsheba. And I believe that even though David committed a grievous sin on that occasion, that nevertheless, David's penitence was genuine. And that when he looked back on what he did, he was filled with remorse. And the 51st Psalm, the least was written at the time of David's remorse over the great sin that he committed with Bathsheba. 
comes through loud and clear. What David is David recognizing God's forgiveness when he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to thy multitude of your tender mercy, blot out my transgressions. David knew that though he was a man who went after God's own heart, he had committed a great transgression, and now that he was looking to God not for justice, but was looking to God for mercy. And then in the 86th Psalm, in verse 5, he said, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. So God is merciful, and he will extend mercy. I know that tonight we need the mercy of God. I recognize that we're members of the body of Christ. I recognize that we have the right to call upon God as our Father. But not one of us doesn't have times of temptation in our life and times that we sin and times that we fall short of the glory of God. Now, I don't stand before you tonight as a perfect man, not in the sense of sinless. But I stand before you as a man who recognizes his own weaknesses and depends upon the mercy of God. Let us not be like the man who went down to the temple and prayed and said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like this, over, this other man over here. Look what I do for you. I think we all would rather be like the man who lifted up his eye, or would not even lift up his eye for heaven, and to be merciful to me, a sinner. I find sometimes among members of the church a terrible self righteousness. Those who would criticize the truth of penitent, those who would be hard hearted, and those who not even understand so much the need of mercy in their own life because they cannot see mercy in operation in the life of others. And some individuals so self-righteous they won't extend mercy to the Christian, the Christian who sins. So uh, uh, self-righteous they won't extend mercy in their own heart toward those who've been a child of God and gone astray. Or they don't feel a real sense of compassion on the person who comes down to the front, names the name of Christ, and is baptized for a nation of sins. I say to you that every heart will be touched. I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over every sinner that repents. Who among us who all be members of the church ought to be touched deeply by the fact that when those we love in the church of Jesus Christ go astray and come back to God, how quickly we all receive them, and if we don't have that kind of an attitude of mercy and forgiveness toward those others, how can I expect God to forgive me when I sin? And it's not a matter of whether or not I will sin, it is when I sin. We have no business standing back to self-righteousness and pointing the finger at somebody else and say, I'm not going to forgive them because of who I am. I understand my need to my mercy and grace before God's throne. I don't believe that any one of us has a right to present God and the community from a self-righteous plateau. I'm afraid sometimes that we turn off our neighbors and our community because we sort of have the attitude that we've got God in our hip pocket. And that we are standing before them as somebody sinless and perfect. And that we, if they will just look to us, we can tell them what to do to go to heaven. I recognize that we have the gospel. I'm not making apologies for that. I've seen too many times self-righteous members of the church turn all people out of the community when all the world we need to do is tell those in sin of the mercy of God and how that mercy of God can be applied. And I believe that it certainly can be applied. But I want to indicate to you tonight, the Bible teaches that God requires something prior to mercy. God requires something before mercy is extended. We need to recognize that mercy is not limitless or that mercy is not without some conditions. In Isaiah 55 and verse 7, <coughs> Isaiah said, let the wicked man forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Notice the word abundantly again. God is not stingy. And he will abundantly pardon those who sin. But before we come to God and expect mercy, Isaiah says, you've got to forsake your way, you've got to forsake your thoughts, and you've got to return to the Lord, and then God will have mercy on you. Now, when people take James 2, verse 13, they suggest in some way that mercy triumphs over judgment so that you can go on and sin and sin and sin and do anything you want to and be rebellious toward God. And God is going to wave his hand and act like you haven't sinned and forgive you in your sin. That's not what the Bible teaches. And there, I believe, is a harmony between Isaiah 55, that we read just a moment ago, and James 2, 13. And the fact that, that certainly God has made an arrangement whereby mercy can triumph over judgment. 
so that I don't go to God's throne and meet justice and judgment. But I go to the throne of God, falling upon God, pleading for mercy. And I believe mercy is certainly can be found from God. Again, in Luke chapter 1, verse 50. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Do you fear God? Is there a reverential awe in your heart toward God? I know that you want mercy tonight. That it requires a certain kind of attitude toward God. I don't believe a person can have an attitude where you thumb your nose at God and expect mercy. And I've heard individuals say, Well, I'll die and go to hell before I'll change my ways. Yes, you will. That kind of an attitude you have, then yes, you'll die and go to hell. I remember going one time to see a scene lady who'd been out of duty for quite some time and got talking with her about her condition. And was trying to be plain and yet be loving and trying to show her that the brethren wanted her to come back. And she was in the kitchen washing dishes. And she got down to the pan. And I want you to know I've heard pans clattered right before all my life. And I was fearful that she might have thrown them at me. But that was her attitude. She said, man, man in this. And she said, I'm just dying on hell for I'll go down, walk down my aisle and get from those brethren and say I've done anything wrong. I'll tell you something, if you have that kind of attitude, you better get ready to judge <coughs> There's not going to be mercy. If I'm so self-righteous and hard toward God that I'm going to bend my knees and say to God, I'm sorry for what I've done. Don't go to the judgment of God of God thanking for mercy. Because there won't be it. When I have the attitude I'm going to do what I want to do, we live in a time when human rights, however much important they are for us, have been taken to an opposite extreme. People are claiming their rights. Their rights for this, their rights for that. So much so that somewhere God's rights have sort of got lost in the shuffle. Where people say all the time, well, you know, I only have one day off. I work six days a week and I've got a right to go to the lake on Sunday. No, you don't. You don't have a right to miss the assembly to Sunday. You don't have a right to do anything. It comes between you and your service to God on the Lord's day because Jesus died to give him his right. It's the Lord's day. He died to make it his day. Somebody has the attitude that I can put my rights above the Lord's rights. When I can do what I want to do, regardless of what the Bible tells me to do, then don't expect mercy. Because I don't believe the mercy is going to be there. He said here that if you want to have mercy, fear him from generation to generation. In Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul, in some of those statements that are somewhat difficult as to deal with God's mercy, indicates, of course, that God has a right to show mercy to those whom he will show mercy. Romans 9 and verse 18, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Now let me pause here and say that the Calvinist idea of that is false and cold. Their idea of that, of course, is that God has chosen before the world forever formed certain individuals by name. And God is going to have mercy, let's say, to this lady right here, and he's going to let her go to heaven. It's because he chose her. But here's a man over here, and he says, no, this man, he's going to go to hell. Well, why is he going to go to hell? God says, because I chose him. He's going to go there. Now, the Calvinistic doctrine of predestination is horrible and ugly because it suggests that God is arbitrary. He sends some to hell regardless of their desire to do good. He sends some to heaven. Regardless of their desire to do evil. But all that Romans chapter 9 is saying is that God has the right to choose. Now I affirm that so. God has the right to choose those upon whom he's going to show mercy. Notice again in Romans 9 and verse 18. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills. And whom he wills he hearts. Now the point of that is that God is not being arbitrary to that. And that all of the will of God is expressed in regard to God's nature. God is going to choose certain ones to go to heaven. I have no doubt of that whatsoever. God is going to express a will. But now then, who are those whom God has mercy toward? Who are those whom God hardens? Well, I believe that the clue to that is found in Jesus Christ. You see, mercy is to be found in Jesus Christ. And God has made choice. His choice is that I'm going to have mercy upon those who trust in Jesus. That's God's choice. And those who reject Jesus, I'm going to heart. Now, a good illustration of that is in the Old Testament, the time of Pharaoh. When God sent the 
command of Pharaoh through Moses to let my people go. The command of God was righteous and good. When he told Pharaoh, let my people out of bondage, let them go. Because God chose to send a command to Pharaoh that was righteous, he knew that being the kind of person he was, Pharaoh was going to ignore that, and therefore God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The Bible says so. On the other hand, the Bible also said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. That is, that when the command of God came to Pharaoh, let the people of God go, he hardened his heart because of free will and chose not to let the people of God go out of bondage. And that's exactly the way it is in Jesus Christ. God has sent Jesus Christ into the world. And God's choice is, let's do it carefully, God's choice is those that believe in Jesus Christ are going to be saved, and those who don't believe in Jesus Christ are going to be lost. But you make up your mind as to whether or not you believe in Jesus Christ. God could have, if it had been like men, he could have chosen the wealthy. Only millionaires are going to go to heaven. God could have chosen just women. Only women are going to heaven. So you've got all kinds of choices to make. And God could have chosen, and I suppose there are some men who think only men are going to go to heaven. No women are good enough to go to heaven. Out of that attitude, of course, it's kind of the equalize of men. People who have been abused. But you see, there are all kinds of choices that could be made. Who's going to go to heaven? Only middle class white America? I think that's sometimes how members of the church think about it. That only these certain ones are going to go to heaven. How, how is God going to express that choice? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, God made a choice. He told us what that choice is. And that choice is fair. And that choice is equitable. And everyone has choice as to whether or not you're among those groups that go to heaven. If you don't mind marking in your Bible, you might want to emphasize it even by ten sort of in your mind, but you'll probably the verse 3. And notice how many times in Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 3, down to these verses that either the phrase Christ or the Lord are pronouns that refer to him are expressed in Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Here's God's choice. And it's great. God is not going to express mercy toward Americans. He's not going to express mercy just toward Russians. He's not going to express mercy just toward rich people. He's not going to just let white folks go to heaven. He's going to let only people go to heaven who are in Christ. That's what he's saying. That's God's choice. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. You see that? Those are the ones that God are choosing. Those who are going to accept Jesus Christ, now whether or not you accept Jesus Christ is up to you. God has never violated free will. I am so impressed the more I study about free will. The trees glorify God because they're trees and they can't anything else. And the planet that is evolved through the heavens glorify God by their place in the heavens. The Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the idea is that things that God uh, has made, those things glorify God by their existence. A beautiful bird that sings glorifies God. But a bird can only be a bird. And a tree can only be a tree. And it can't be anything else. And it's somewhat like robots. God programmed them. Programmed them. And they exist. And they praise God by their existence. But in the process of creation, God made something greater than birds, and greater than trees, and greater than planets. He made a being that has free will. And the highest that man can ever attain is when he chooses out of free will to serve God. And there will never be a time when God violates your free will short of the judgment day. You can choose to thumb your nose at God. Trees don't do it. Birds don't do it. Dogs don't do it. Planets don't do it. But man can. 
man can say no to God. And that's an awesome responsibility. And I tell you, when you begin to recognize the fact that God has given us the right to choose to go to heaven or hell, it's an awesome responsibility. But now then, God did that so that there would be a creature that would serve him out of free will. And that's what Ephesians 1 is saying, that God said, I'm going to choose the ones to go to heaven. And the ones that I'm choosing to go to heaven are going to be people that accept Jesus. And nobody else is going to go. All the spiritual blessings and heavenly places are located in Christ. That relationship, Ephesians 1, 3. He's blessed with all those things. We're accepted in the beloved. We've been predestined in the beloved. We've been foreordained in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound for us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which on earth, in him, and whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's in the three as it possibly can be. The point is that mercy is in Jesus Christ. Now, the ultimate thought of that is, therefore, that mercy is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those that connection is there. I want to show you clearly that the Bible has said all along that this verse is in Christ Jesus under the gospel. And Isaiah 55 and verse 3, Isaiah said again, Incline your ear and come to me, here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Now what in the world are the sure mercies of David? Now, I don't believe that we could ever really understand apart from the New Testament fulfillment of that, but when you come to the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, in the sermon that is being preached in, in uh, verse 34, Acts 13, 34, it is proclaimed that he raised him from the dead. No more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure verses of David. So in the sermon here you have Jesus Christ being proclaimed as the fulfillment of the promises of the sure verses of David. Now the second Samuel 7. Samuel talked about the throne of David that be established and the great salvation that comes to the kingdom of God when Jesus Christ was raised to sit at the throne of David. Acts chapter 2, we know when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he ascended to the throne of David. Now we have in chapter 13, verse 34, they, they fulfill the fact that in Isaiah, the sure verses of David are applied to Jesus Christ. So then all the blessings are in Christ Jesus. In Luke chapter 1, well before that, in Mark chapter 10, verse 47, I don't, think, I don't think it's an accident that when Jesus Christ walked on the earth and performed the great marvelous works that he did and taught what he did, the people said in Mark 10, verse 47, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he would again to cry and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now how did that man know to connect Jesus Christ to mercy and that he was son of, the son of David? Because those people were, were familiar with the Old Testament. And I believe they understood that through Jesus Christ was being fulfilled the promises about the sure mercies of David. Then in Luke chapter 1, at the birth of John, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who men since the world began, that we should be saved from enemies and from the hand of all who hated us, to perform the mercy promised by our fathers. You see, the prophets understood, and Zacharias by, uh, by the Spirit understood that the, the case. Then down in verse 78 he said, he's going to do that through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's just, it's just clear beyond misunderstanding that mercy is understood in Jesus Christ. Now how do I understand that? Well, it's through the gospel 
In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, now while you're waiting, Adonai told Saul, arise, arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why did Adonai tell Saul to call on the name of the Lord? Well, I'll go back to Psalms 86 and verse 5. Then the psalmist said, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, we're told very clearly that we're called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of this is saying clearly that mercy is found not just out here floating around in the air somewhere, but God has specifically promised mercy to be found in Jesus Christ. Let us go back to our text in James 2, 13, and sort of wind this together. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What this is saying is not universal salvation. This is not saying that God is going to be benevolent, kind, and doting, and just let you go ahead and sin all that you want to. And when you find in mixed judgment, you're going to find that God is just sort of poof, bullet and made emotion, and all judgment is gone, and you'll be merciful to you. No, the point is that because of the righteousness of God, God made an arrangement whereby He could be just and still forgive transgression. That's through Jesus Christ. I pointed out this morning, Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. God, out of the righteous nature, said, The soul that sinned shall surely die. I sinned, therefore I'll to die. But God, through his mercy, supplied Jesus Christ. When I therefore accept Jesus, instead of judgment for my sins, I'm forgiven. And forgiveness is the key to mercy. Therefore I come to God, begging for mercy, through the application of the blood of Christ in my life. Mercy, therefore, listen to the carefully. Mercy is found in the church and in the gospel and in forgiveness, not at the judgment day. If you're waiting for the judgment day, and like some people say, well, I'm just going to fall on the mercy of God. I, I knew a woman one time who was living in adultery. And she said, I know that I'm living in adultery. And she's very bold about it. She said, I know that my life is not right with God. But she said, I'm going to live the best way that I know to live here in the church. And when I die, and the judge will die, it's going to fall on the mercy of God. Now, folks, she's got it wrong. Do you think that you can live in any sin, knowing that that's a sin, and then finally the judgment day fall on the mercy of God? Then you've got mercy all along. Bible doesn't anywhere teach that concept, that idea of mercy. Suppose the end of this woman can live in a book all her life and then fall on the mercy of God. What about the thief? Maybe he's just got a weak nature. Maybe he's got a drug habit. And so he's got to go on stealing, knowing that's wrong, and finally the judge will just fall on the mercy of God. What about the man who's alive? What about the man who's homosexual? What about all these people living in whatever sin you want to name? Knowing that's wrong, go ahead and say, well, I'm going to do it, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and be a Christian. Now, John says you can't walk in darkness and claim to be a child of God. You do your life. The truth is in you. But there are people who have that attitude that I go on, and there are preachers today who are advocating this kind of concept, this kind of relationship with God. Yeah, I know that you're living in sin, we just go ahead and live in sin and finally fall on God's mercy as the judgment does. I'm not going to be found guilty of preaching that kind of thing because that's not the gospel of Christ. And I, I believe there's mercy. I said before you have a person that needs the mercy of God, and I know that. But I understand the Bible tells me that mercy is to be found in Jesus Christ. And obedience to the gospel. And walking in the light, 1 John chapter 1. And penitence. And asking God to be merciful for the forgiveness of my sins. And mercy is comprehended in forgiveness. So James chapter 2 verse 13. The reason why mercy applies for the judgment is because of forgiveness. I can be forgiven through the blood of Christ. And that can be done now while I live on the earth. And if I live in a sinful way of life and finally get the judgment day and think that I can just fall on the mercy of God, having lived a sinful life, I have to really understood God's word at all. It's possible, and I'm not talking to someone who's not a Christian. I plead with you, don't think that you will be like living a reprobate life. Never having obeyed the gospel. Never having been baptized. Never having been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Live your life 
Oh, in sin, apart from the church, apart from God, and then finally when you get to the judgment, they say, God, be merciful to us. You're looking for mercy. It's to be found at the cross. You're looking for mercy to be found in the gospel. And, and again, I tell you, the Bible says that God is rich in mercy. He's not sin. He's abundant in loving kindness. He wants you to go to heaven. God is not willing that any should perish. So all should come to repentance. He wants us to be saved. God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. He wants people to be saved, but He's chosen the ones that are going to go to heaven. Romans 9 shows that God has exercised choice. And that choice is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If tonight you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you wish to, to be forgiven all the sins of your life, then you're going to find the merciful God. You come to God and He'll help he'll, Abundantly pardon you. He's not going to just like ease you carefully over into the Christ. He's going to abundantly pardon you. Sir. If you're a member of the body of Christ and you've done something ungodly, something wrong, and you know that your life is wrong, God wants you to be saved. He has no pleasure in the death of a wicked person. And when a member of the church has done wrong, acknowledges your sin, acknowledges you've lived wrong, there is abundant pardon for you. God is not going to stingy you. Look at you and remember that. It'll be gone. It'll be gone forever. God will abundantly pardon you. But you've got to do all this time about sin. I don't think you can go on living your life with sin. And then finally, when you get to the judgment day, find a gracious God and just got to look for him. At the judgment day, outside of Christ, there'll be judgment and no mercy. Today is the day of salvation. If you are not your heart. Your president, I, I don't want to leave this sermon with you without emphasizing again and again that God is abundant mercy. He wants you to be saved. He wants those outside of Christ to come into Christ. He wants those in Christ who've gone astray to come back home to the Lord. And when that happens, God is going to be so rich and forgiving and loving and tender and kind. He'll restore you to his fellowship and everything that you've had wrong in your life will be gone. Now is the time to do this. I pray for you, you'll have the courage to step to the front of the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll stand again and I'll stand. Won't you come? Lord, God, gentlemen.